Um, my name is Cameron Deason Hammond. I'm um, thrilled and honored to um, have inherited the position of moderator on this panel. Um, I will uh, just say a few words of housekeeping um, before we get started, and uh, and then um, Angelo John Lewis is going to lead us in a brief meditation. So I um, am a teacher, and I like to have a roadmap of how the next hour and a half is going to go. So I'm going to provide you with that roadmap. Um, I'm going to set us up with uh, just some brief comments, um, introduction of myself, um, and then our um, panelists are going to introduce themselves to you very briefly. Um, and then we're going to jump into a conversation. And um, my hope and our hope is that this is a conversation um, more than it is um, sort of us individually talking about our lives and our work. But we hope to um, you know, spark some things up among ourselves and, and in your minds as well. Um, and then we'll leave 15 minutes at the end for questions. So um, we'll look forward to that where we can engage uh, you all in conversation. So, um, okay, all right, Angelo John Lewis, take it away. So everything I'm gonna say is optional. You know, if you don't have to close your eyes, but I'll suggest that you do or whatever. Um, I invite you if you want to um, notice what's going on with your breathing. And if you like, close your eyes. There's been a lot going on today throughout the conference. Just for the moment, allow that to go and be present with the sound of my voice. And the feeling of your breathing. Just notice whatever thoughts you have Allow them to just be there. You don't need to do anything about them. I invite you to invite someone that's not here that maybe you would like to be here in your imagination. Sort of a theater, so they're watching it with you. And in addition, if you feel comfortable, I invite you to invite your ancestors, your immediate family, the people that came before, the people that gave birth to you. If you feel comfortable, acknowledge their presence. Ask for them to give us up here and you the wisdom that they collectively have so that we could all learn from each other. That's enough. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So as I began mm -hmm. to think about my first task in, um, in moderating this panel, which was meant to have been moderated by my friend Stuart Davis, um, who is not here, sadly. Um, but I was met with um, a very familiar challenge, uh, and that is uh, how to decide which, of, which version of myself to offer you today. Um, there are several versions. I am a musician. I've produced nine albums of music. Um, I'm also a teacher. I'm a teacher of spiritual memoir. Um, some of my students are here today. Mm. Hi, guys. Mm. Um, I am um, a writer and a thinker as well. Um, and as I th thought about that challenge of deciding which uh, of the selves to offer you, I realized that all of us on this panel face that challenge in our daily life quite frequently. We are all of us. Um, polymaths up here on the stage, and I don't think it's an overstatement um, to say that. We are uh, thinkers and writers and filmmakers and podcasters um, and mystics. Um, and so what I hope we will offer today and discuss today is how we meet the additional challenge of translating uh, the ineffable of our experiences uh, for the public. Right, so to go to our 
um, our title today, um, The Impossible and, and Public Cultures. Um, and so I thought maybe we could look at um, a quote from uh, Kate Chopin just to kind of get us, get us going um, that I think speaks to this challenge of communicating to public cultures the ineffable. Um, and this is the quote. But the beginning of things, of a world especially, is necessarily vague, tangled, chaotic, and exceedingly disturbing. How few of us ever emerge from such a beginning. How many souls perish in its tumult. So of course, Kate Chopin, um, thought of as an early 20th century feminist, um, was talking about um, the issues that she faced as a woman um, in uh, late 1800s. Today, I think um, for us and our purposes, this resonates with our challenges um, as communicators and artists. So with that said, uh, we will move on to just brief introductions. Um, David Metcalf, take it away. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I am David Metcalf. I have um, <clears throat> most recently been given the, uh, the role of the scholar in virtual residence with the Winbridge Institute. Um, which is an institute that looks at consciousness and um, they're most famous probably for Julie Beichel's mediumship research. Um, but that role kind of comes through the work that I do, I guess, you know, in this idea of public cultures and discourse, um, which is, I guess, I would best be defined as hosting conversations online through the tools that we all sort of use, Twitter, Facebook, um, blogging, uh, you know, being a guest on podcasts, and bringing about um, kind of a conversation around the topics um, that we're all talking about here. Um, you know, through my work in various official functions, I've been a contributing editor to web magazines. Um, you know, I, I've been a writer, I've written music journalism, um, and kind of just really explored every aspect that I could of the digital space. Um, you know, I've, I've made... Uh, soundscape music, ambient music, so all the tools of digital space to kind of host these conversations, write about these ideas, and sort of bring people together in that from both, you know, the researchers, um, you know, folks who have experiences, um, different la layers of culture, um, you know, whether that's, I personally live in rural Georgia, so having these conversations on the street with people who may not have access to this level of, of conversation about it. Um, and so really bringing that forward through the digital space, um, often unofficially and without any sort of official standing to do so, and just sort of creating that through digital culture. OK. Uh, I'm Greg Bishop. I uh, started out uh, my my only degree is in art history, and I guess I had a minor in film. Um, and since those are two extremely not useful things to major in, at least at least that's what I thought at the time, a few years later I started, um, again, reading and uh, thinking about uh, mostly the UFO subject, but all these other related subjects too. I read all the books when I was a kid, probably like most of you did. And um, in 1991, um, I started a magazine called The Excluded Middle with two friends, and um, that was almost like going to college a second time for me, and I got to interview all these people. Nobody ever said no to an interview, which was kind of amazing, so I got to talk to all these amazing people like uh, um, Joe McMonigle and Keith Thompson and Dean Radin and all that uh, at that time. Um, and then in uh, 2000, uh, a book of all the magazines was published, kind of an anthology. In 2005, um, I had a book called Project Beta, which was about a UFO researcher who was um, uh, basically messed with by the US government for looking at stuff he wasn't supposed to be, although he didn't, he didn't know it. He thought it was UFOs. Um, uh, next year, I wrote most of a book called Weird California, just about all kinds of strange things in, in California, which is where I was born, grew up, and still live. Um, earlier in the late 2000s, I was on a uh, pirate radio station in Los Angeles that was shut down two or three times by the FCC, but I started um, interviewing people and playing music on that station. 
and I still do that interviewing uh, on a show called Radio Mysterioso, which you can access online. Um, and due to all of these projects and all of these people and everybody I've met, including everybody here, um, you know, uh, Jeff, Jacques, Whitley, everybody, um, I came up with an idea to put together a uh, set of cards that combine the uh, archetypes of the tarot with the themes and people and ufology. And um, that is the project I'm working on right now. David's one of the uh, members of my group, five people. The artist is Miguel Romero, who is watching now. Hi, Miguel. Um, Susan Demeter St. Clair and also Josh Cutchin, they are all in the group. We are nine cards into the 22 cards of the Major Arcana, which I will show you when appropriate here, I guess. And um, yeah, I just, uh, and I'll describe it a little bit better when I uh, do a short presentation on it. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> my name's Angelo John Lewis. Um, I guess I just want to remark on a couple of things. Uh, I, 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 should, I would have liked to have done this during the meditation thing, but um, we're on, this is something that um, younger people do, and I love it, which is to acknowledge the, the, the sort of land that we're on, which is the, Aku, somebody help me here, Akukisha land. That, that's the land that we're in, and uh, I think it's uh, nice to acknowledge that. I also want to acknowledge the synchronicity thing um, of life. You know, um, I'm noticing I'm sitting next to a black man. It's almost like reality organizes itself. We didn't plan this. I don't mean just him, but you know, there's this thing that I'm, I'll talk about in a minute called group relations, which perhaps some of you are familiar with. But what happened was that around the Second World War, um, there, all of what became consulting and um, sort of training, um, there, was, there was a sort of a flowering of people that were involved in that. And most of it, you're probably familiar with if you've been in any supervisory training, you'll see ac action research and people will do activities uh, that are around personal development, which can be applied to many things. Another branch of this, which is somewhat unknown, is the group relations people, commonly known in the UK as Tavistock. And their thing is that the, 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 um, the, the group itself is an organism. And so um, a kind of a subset of that is that reality is constantly organizing itself, whether you do anything or not. Um, it's, there's no accident that we're all here in this particular place. Um, anyway, enough about that. <laughs> <laughs> so um, anyway, just a little bit about me. Um, I, I'm, I'm the, the director of the Sacred Inclusion Network. I could tell you a lot about me, but I talk too much. But let me just tell you about that. Um, <clears throat> in 1996, um, me and some other people, including a Benedictine, uh, excuse me, a Jesuit priest and a couple of other people, started something called the Diversity and Spirituality Network. We were in a group relations conference, and because I kept hearing this phrase, diversity and spirituality, going back and forth in my mind, I would mention it to people that I thought were interesting. And um, even though in a group relations context, it's a little, you don't really talk to the presenters. You know, you just like. You're just supposed to just be there and just sort of behave like a sheep, you know what I mean? But in any event, I had to talk to Renee because what happened was that at exactly the time the thing happened, this is a typical group relations thing. So let's say it's supposed to start at one o'clock. They all, like they, 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 all the presenters or consultants walked up the aisle and they sat on a thing like this, right? No icebreakers, nothing, right? And Zachary Green, who was like the, now a friend of mine, but he was like the leader, he proceeds to read what we're going to do. Nothing. And I'm, I looked at my friend and said, oh, shit, what the fuck? Why, what are we doing here? You know, this is, but in any event, and, and so I, I started to ask a question, and, he, and, and, and Zachary said, the information you need is in your packet. I said, shit. <laughs> I I'm not going to ask any more questions. You know? <laughs> I'm just going to like behave. However, being sneaky, I looked at the, the program and I saw all the bio, the bio, the biographies of the different people that were consultants, one of whose Dr. Renee Mollenkamp, now at the University of San Diego, um, just got tenure or something, or maybe just a job, I forget. But in any event, he was the Jesuit, ex Jesuit priest. So, so I just like courageously got up and said, Renee, I got to talk to you about this, Dr. Mollenkamp. And he said, oh, I'm very interested in this, but can we talk after the thing? So that, anyway, that led to a, a series of discussions, not with him, but with Zachary, who, uh, whose father was on the Cleveland Browns, of all things. 
and who terrified me as like the, the, the sort of like the lead consultant, this like fierce black man with all this academic thing. You know, I, I was scared of this brother, you know what I mean? But in any event, um, our conversation led to the, what, 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 what was called the Diversity and Spirituality Network. And we had a number of principles, one which is that we were an emerging community. We didn't dare call ourselves a community. I don't remember the others. There was, there was, there was a couple of others also. <laughs> it's a long time ago, 96, and I'm old. I don't remember things. So in any event, uh, it was probably the most intense period of my life, from 96 to 99. Um, this is before the flowering of the Internet. Which, and that, what we would do, we would have things called experiential explorations um, in various cities, um, mostly in um, Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia region. And the demographics of the group were twofold that sort of overlapped. One was people that had identity, I'll call them identity issues, meaning they were, you know, maybe they were gay, maybe they were female. In other words, they had some, from the point of view of society, something problematic about their identity they wanted to explore. And there were other people were, the other demographic were people that were consultants, um, trainers who liked to just, you know, do stuff, try different types of activities. And that's what our thing was. It was it was about it was very experience based, and we would uh, we we had two different sort of activities. We were called explorations. One were public and one were private. The private ones we would invent some topic that we as an emerging community were dealing with. One of which was um, the in group and the out group. So we had people that had been with the group for a long time and people that were very new to us. And as you can imagine, there were some dynamics involved with that. So we would kind of like created activities to look at that. And, um, and, the, at, and then we would just write back and forth, what did it mean, what did it mean, da, 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 da. And then we had public activities. And the best of our activities were like in like two, three to five day conferences. So anyway, for, at, at around 1999, the organization dissolved for a number of reasons. And even at that time, I knew I would always, I always knew that I would bring it back. And in 2016, uh, with, the, with the help of, um, Two of my former um, planning group members, um, we started again, and, uh, and it became mostly an online thing. We would do online explorations, uh, which we do. Oh, my ad is, is up there. <laughs> no, it's not, not yet. Yeah, it's up. Oh, it's not there. Okay, he's going to change it. Thank you. Uh, uh, not no, the tarot not stuff. It. Mine's no. the simplest one. There it is, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, in any event, um, towards probably... I don't know, a couple of years ago, um, we or mostly I decided, look, the diversity and spirituality thing, that's not working as a name for us anymore. Because frankly, we were more interested in, um, well, two things. We were more, more, more interested in spirituality. And also, the inclusion seemed like a nicer frame than the sort of divisive word of diversity. Um, and so the Sacred Inclusion Network was, bo was born. And uh, if you want to learn more about it, since I've already talked too long, um, you can go on the website and see. Um, we also have a private community um, trying to get off the Facebook thing. I think it's labeled there. Um, you could basically join. It's sort of like a private, um, it's just private, but anybody can join. And our principal activities are these um, um, monthly um, explorations, for example. I do a podcast. I've done several with the esteemed Dr. Jeffrey Kripal, took, 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 took about a year for him to get him to agree. He was so busy, finally I think I wore him down, you know. But he's such a gracious man, you know. Immediately, if he likes you, he invites you into his spear, which is sort of why I'm here, you know what I mean? Um, it, it's, it's an, aside from being a scholar that I, I really respect, and I'm probably the least academic person in this entire room, I have no degrees at all, proud of it, uh, but in any event, this man invited me, said, we got to get you to come to Esalen. That hasn't happened yet. And he says, i got this thing going on here. Would you like to come? I said, well, Jeff, you know, yeah, especially if you pay part of my way. I don't even think that was part of the conversation anyway. But um, anyway, that's me. So we have, we have this thing. You could learn more about it. And I've talked a lot here. So um, I'm going to turn it over to Marcus here. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Marcus Red. Um, I usually describe myself by talking about three different areas that I work in. I consider myself a traditional African cosmologist, an independent scholar, and a multimedia artist. So as a traditional African cosmologist, I'm very interested in recovering, modernizing, and extending 
African uh, metaphysical systems. I've spent a lot of time thinking through, practicing um, ancient Egyptian metaphysics, but also interested in several different West African traditions, Yoruba, Dogen, Igbo, Dagra specifically. I'm interested in these traditions because they are what the French philosopher Swallow de Lubitsch would call sacred sciences. So in other words, they're modes of knowledge that are not interested in studying the external world, but in creating these fusions of art, science, and religion um, for the purpose of deploying very potent rituals and symbols to divinize the human, transform base humanity into gods, basically. And as an independent scholar, I've really worked to research the influence of these ideas across a variety of artistic traditions over time. Um, one of the essays that I've published is on the jazz musician and poet Sun Ra, who was active in the 50s and 60s and had a very interesting multidisciplinary approach to the process of trying to shake people out of um, conventional modes of thinking. I mean, he claimed that he was from Saturn um, and deployed a very esoteric philosophy of music for the purpose of literally expanding, expanding human consciousness. Also written about um, Ishmael Reed, a novelist who wrote a really famous novel called Mambo Jumbo, which is a very zany look at the history of esoteric traditions. So he starts in ancient Egypt, ends in the Harlem Renaissance. Um, and of course, Mambo Jumbo, as we know, is a term that's pejoratively used to describe many of the things we study and talk about at conferences like this. <laughs> Uh, currently working on a book called Ancient Origins, Future Destinies, Blackness, the Word and World Creativity, where I'm looking at all of these issues along with texts like the Ancient Egyptian Pyramid text, the Yoruba Oduifa divination text, Dogen cosmology, things like that. Um, so for the third part, as a multimedia artist, I also try to use my art as a venue to explore these ideas and get them out in front of a large audience. So I released um, my first film last year. It was called Obiumbu, which means the primordial house. It's an Igbo um, creation story. And it actually draws on one of the many, I mean, there are at least nine different cosmological paradigms in the Igbo tradition. But this film um, is an experimental dance film that focuses on one of them. Um, it follows these two figures that are painted um, with this ultra, um, with this fluorescent body paint. The whole film is shot under ultraviolet light which gives it this really cosmic aura, but it follows these two figures, Chuku and Ekene Chuku, who we could think of as the masculine and feminine polarities of the cosmos. And it charts out um, their progression from existing in unity, kind of as the blackness of space, to this stage of separation and conflict that allows the world to come into being. Um, I've also done a um, public art installation with the Pittsburgh Symphony Orchestra, a campaign called Playing the Cosmic Strings, which is basically an image of myself on a 1,200 square foot billboard acting out another particular Igbo tradition. Of, so I'm playing the role of the cosmic spider that basically takes the strings and is spinning the strings, these infinite strings that um, move throughout all of creation and are always vibrating. Do we have an image of that or? I do have an image, but it will probably- We'll have to get, yeah. I can find it, okay. yeah, before the panel's right. over. <laughs> and most recently I curated an exhibition called Anatomy of the Human, uh, which basically explores this idea of multiple spiritual bodies through the use of stop action photography. And it just was released maybe a few weeks ago, and you can see it on about, it's on about 100 digital kiosks around Miami, Denver, Cleveland, Columbus, and Tampa. So those are my three areas. All right. Thanks, Thank Marcus. you, Marcus. Um, I'm J. Christopher King. I'm a community manager and co-founder of the Experiencer Group, along with Kirsten Blackburn, who's up there with the flaming red hair, and uh, Stuart Davis, who unfortunately wasn't able to make it this week. Um, I'm also an artist. My solo and collaborative artwork has been shown at venues, including the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid, James Cohen Gallery, and the Museum of Modern Art in New York. After showing art through grad school, I began working in TV as a writer and producer for travel, adventure, and food shows primarily for the Discovery Channel and its properties. More recently, through the Experiencer Group, 
The Experiencer Group is a private member site dedicated to support curiosity and community for people who've had anomalous events of any and all kinds, UFO, ET experiencers, also near death, out of body, psi phenomena, ghosts and spirits, all forms of the anomalous, or as Annalisa put it yesterday, exceptional encounters. We founded the Experiencer Group at the beginning of last year. Kirsten and I got to know each other doing work for the historian and ufologist Richard Dolan originally with his member site. Through that work, we began co-hosting a network of confidential support groups for fellow experiencers, which grew, which grew exponentially through the lockdown, furlough, and work from home months of the pandemic. I came out of the experiencer closet myself pretty recently in September of last year through an article by Ralph Blumenthal, who profiled me and four <clears throat> other abduction experiencers whose case his, he'd looked into. It was originally slated to come out in the New York Times, where Ralph was a bureau chief and published those famous articles with Leslie, but the article was narrowly rejected after months of work and ended up being published on the debrief. In our first year of the Experiencer Group, we hosted 124 events, primarily through Zoom. The vast majority are support meetings, also Ask Me Anything sessions with guests. Marcus is going to be a guest coming up soon. Roundtable podcast discussions, a wonderful women's group led by Kirsten and uh, Linda White, who is also with us today. A book club and other excuses to get together and share. There's also a robust private social media site where people can post and continue those conversations at all hours, and they do. I'm very happy to be here and happy to help represent our part of the wider experiencer community. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. So um, when we were at lunch, uh, kind of getting to know each other a bit and, and talking about how we wanted to um, kind of run this hour, um, we very quickly got into a conversation about how many of us grew up in a haunted house. Um, we, um, we talked about this idea of our mutant hood, which I think most of us, if not all of us in this room, can relate to. Um, so I thought maybe we might talk about that question of how we know ourselves to be experiencers of the, um, of the impossible and how, um, how that has affected sort of our public facing lives and our public facing work. Um, I, I grew up and I'll just say this really quickly. I grew up, uh, what I, what I call as sort of like a witchy agnostic Jew. Um, my parents were irreligious and I was obsessed with all things religion and spirituality, um, beginning with hauntings, um, experiences of seeing things and hearing things, Claire audience as a child. Um, I converted to evangelical Christianity in my 20s um, in New York City just prior to 9-11 um, as I was trying to make my way through the world as a sexual um, woman um, and not die. Um, and I thought that Jesus was my best bet um, for um, for not dying from sex. So I became a Christian. Um, and then since then, um, I've been perhaps unsurprisingly deconverting um, and finding my way back to what I call in some circles um, feminist esoterica and what I call in other circles witchcraft. Um, and so that's kind of where I, I'm living spiritually now. Um, and as I said earlier, and we talked about a bit, um, religious systems or systems in general um, have always drawn me in as a way to try to explain to myself and to others my experiences, right? Um, and I think that that's part of our challenge here is, is how do we explain to others? How do we make work um, that communicates essentially the ineffable? So, so maybe we could talk about our mutant hood. Um, Jay, I really want to hear about your haunted house story. And David, you also have a, I grew up in a haunted house story and how that kind of you know, funnels into what you're, the work you're doing now. Yeah. And oh, okay. Um, yeah. Me first? I mean, whatever, anybody. All right. Yeah, just uh, whoever. Ghost stories. <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, the first kind of haunting situation that happened with me um, was when I was about six years old. Um, my, my mother and father, we moved to Mishawaka, Indiana, and... Mm -hmm. Um, the very first night uh, that some of the boxes came into the basement, um, they were my father's old engineering manuals. Um, it's always interesting the objecthood of what a poltergeist chooses to work with. 
okay? And my very uh, rational father, it was his engineering manuals, and so these giant book boxes, incredibly heavy, um, were rearranged into a checkerboard pattern when people got up in the morning uh, across the entire floor of the basement, the unfinished basement. Um, that was the start of several years of really intense um, poltergeist activity, shadow figures, apparitions um, in that house. That wasn't the only house that was that haunted or poltergeist phenomena um, were in. There was a later house in Minnesota, in Woodbury, Minnesota, where there were similar things. Um, and back then, there, were, there weren't great resources online. You know, this is the mid-90s. It was, it was kind of the Wild West of the Internet years, and it was really hard to research at that, at that point. It's easy to forget how, how hard it was to come across this material back then. And it's so much of the phenomenon seemed similar to the point of almost having a, the same identity that we wondered if that somehow that ghost that spirit had had found us as if it had walked all the way from northern Indiana to Minnesota. Um, and yeah, so that, that was the, haunt, the haunting phenomenon then. And I explored it later through um, some really, um, uh, some grad school projects that we can kind of mention later when we can talk about what's the worst thing that ever happened to you <laughs> if you choose to go there. <laughs> Uh, yeah, mine's not as exciting as checkerboard uh, <laughs> boxes and stuff like that. Um, I grew up in a neighborhood just outside of Chicago, um, which is colloquially known as the Mafia Riviera, um, River Grove. It's like right outside of Oak Park, um, where the Frank Lloyd Wright houses are in that. Um, my great-grandfather had built some of the houses, um, and was uh, a plumber that ran liquor for Al Capone. So um, we had sort of a, a family connection to this, this place or whatever. But um, yeah, there was, um, I have two older brothers, both of whom experienced poltergeist effects like things floating, um, doors closing and opening. Um, I personally, as a child, up until we moved from the house at seven, um, saw a sort of like green woman in a mirror whenever I would wake up at night. Um, had experiences where I woke up hovering over the bed and then slamming down. Um, and looking back on it, I realized how odd it was to be like six years old and like staring out a window and like contemplating philosophy after like seeing like a green woman in a mirror. So all of these things kind of like were reflectively like stranger than they were at the time. At the time, it just seemed like, well, totally this is normal. what happens. Yeah, yeah, this is the way it goes. <laughs> um, and my parents were very open about um, enjoying the fact that I would read books. So they mm. just bought me whatever I wanted, which in the late 80s was um, the Time Life Mysteries of the Unknown series, which I think many people are familiar with. Um, we see a uh, hands. How many of us? have? Yeah, yeah this is a... Time, Life, yeah. mis Mysteries of the Unknown Crowd. So I, I read the book, you know, and that introduced me at, like, a way too young age to Aleister Crowley, <laughs> virtual magic, <laughs> and um, detailed stories of, you know, uh, UFOs and that. And my dad happened to be, um, he worked for the telecommunications industry. So um, when we moved to Arizona, that was to work on contracts for NASA and the Air Force. So I would, uh, we would have Air Force colonels over to the house having dinner and that, um, you know, who would encourage my weird ideas because it was interesting for a little kid to be, you know, talking about strange stuff. So, um, yeah, so from the haunting to the Time Life series and then spread out into actually writing about it. And I really enjoyed, uh, Jeff, your idea of the writing so as not to be written, you know. Um, William S. Burroughs said, write yourself into the story. And so a lot of the kind of like public culture stuff is me, mm -hmm. you know, I had these experiences and throughout my life have had different experiences to greater or lesser mm -hmm. extremity and being able to use that conversation to work through that, you know. So I, w I wanted to see if you might talk a little bit about your uh, work with Santa Muerta, yeah. um, which I don't know if it's, if it's right to draw maybe a dotted line between your right. hauntings as a child and your interest as an adult and the work well, that you've done around that. Um, to, uh, to credit 
Eric Wargo's work with uh, dream precognition. I actually had a really intense dream um, before, I think it was like maybe like beginning of college, like end of high school, I had this incredibly intense dream where um, I was in the woods and I was like just filled with fear and running and I fell down at the like the base of a tree and this uh, like Victorian carriage came and it had a skeleton bride in the front of it. And so later I was working uh, my first kind of official professional job out when I, after I had graduated um, at this marketing agency and I was given the task of being like a trend spotter to a certain extent. So the guy was interested in investments and that. So I would, you know, just look at the culture and see what was going on. And one of the things at the time was the, uh, the army was very concerned with this thing called Santa Muerta, which is Saint Death. Um, and it was a, a popular devotional tradition that was growing up in Mexico, was starting to build and build popularity and move into the States. And um, most of the, dev the devotees for Santa Muerta are regular people that are just trying to survive in, in their life, you know? And so it's, they would pray to, to Saint Death for good health and that kind of thing. Um, a small portion of it is it's become integrated with a lot of the cartels. And so it's become, um, you know, sort of, strangely enough, all the, the satanic panic myths of nar narco satanico have become real through some aspect of the Santa Muerta thing. So working this job, trend spotting, I see this come out and I'm like, that's fascinating. You know, my background was in um, cognitive philosophy and comparative religions. And I was like, this whole thing is amazing. Like, how is this growing up? Like, you know, the iconography is very stark. Um, and I didn't think I'd ever have a chance to do anything with it. So fast forward some number of years. Um, I'd been doing uh, some work with uh, the web magazine Reality Sandwich, um, which published Eric Davis and, uh, and a bunch of other people sort of in the the cultural end of these things. And um, so Andrew Chestnut is an academic from Virginia Commonwealth University who wrote a book on Santa Muerta. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, hey, you know, I'm a, I'm a contributing editor. I can choose my own assignments. So I'll assign myself, since I've already been doing this kind of background research on this tradition, to interview him. And so in interviewing him, I then um, ended up becoming sort of like a compatriot helping them create a blog for it and writing about it. So yeah, I mean, my experience of having the dream and then moving forward, and interestingly enough, within the tradition, dreaming is often how people will meet her. And her so, being Her being Santa, Santa Muerte. Muerte. Yeah, mm -hmm. and because um, maybe foolishly, I thought that the only good way that you could really do this would be to build a shrine. Okay. So um, my partner happened to be uh, away at the time and I ordered a bunch of stuff from Mexico <laughs> and she came back to our kitchen table uh, had a big um, Santa Muerta shrine on it which she was not happy about I would not recommend that <laughs> like talk to talk to your the people you were living with before you set up a, a death shrine on your kitchen table um, <laughs> but it, um, you know that was that was probably an area Andrew wasn't willing to go to with the research um, despite the fact that his book ends up on devotees um, altars and that but that really helped me, sort of an experiential um, talking to Santa Muerta to understand where she was coming from in this, mm -hmm. um, which I think would probably be violating a lot of academic ideas. But since I am a public writer, I can do yeah. that sort of stuff. Yeah, so, so we're all, we all exist sort of outside the academy, um, which I think is you know, a big part of the freedom that we're kind of maybe experiencing. I um, mean, also the, the need to have multiple things going at once um, as far as jobs. Um, but so the practitioner, um, researcher, writer kind of divide or not divide. So I, I pre really appreciate what you said about the shrine, which I think is amazing. And, and it makes me think, Marcus, about your work and your research. And um, like, so has there been a moment or do you see yourself as a practitioner um, of the spiritualities that you are writing about and you are making film about or yeah do, would you talk about that? yeah absolutely and I would say it's a different trajectory to sure, meetinghood sure. and then one that actually goes through the academy um, you know I didn't necessarily grow up 
experiencing anomalous things or having experiences that were outside of the box. And in reality, I was on track for a very conventional academic career. I mean, so I barreled through grad school, finished my PhD pretty early, um, got my first faculty position when I was 25. And so I was like, yes, I'm on this path and things are going to be down this prescribed path. Um, but it was interesting because I think the work itself pushed me into a different space. So interestingly enough, as I was um, working, and so my PhD is in English literature, but as I was reading all of these canonical writers, I kept seeing these turns to a mystical Egypt. Literally every single writer. I mean, so Walt Whitman, Herman Melville, Emily Dickinson, Coleridge, I mean, whoever you want to name. I mean, and you could even go back to the Renaissance. I mean, Edmund Spencer, Shakespeare. I mean, they're always... Um, turning to these different signs and figures and symbols in interesting moments, whether it's the hieroglyphics to understand the origin of language or the Sphinx to understand monstrous bodies or um, different kinds of monuments like the pyramid to make certain kinds of points about spiritual illumination. So I think I was just noticing a pattern that was actually in the text themselves. And I think it was interesting because literature, because it is not... Um, having to follow the alignment strictures of science or it's not institutionalized like religion, it became this space, this open space for the quote-unquote pagan, the spiritual, to find a certain kind of safe haven. I mean, even though it was marginalized, as Jeff was saying earlier, under the sign of the imagination, but it still provided a very potent storehouse for all of these hidden or occulted traditions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think I just fell down the rabbit hole by taking the writers that I was looking at seriously. I mean, so I would talk to my colleagues and say, oh, well, do you see all of this hermetic Egyptian esoteric stuff and all of these writers? And people like, oh, no, I didn't even see that. Or I didn't believe it was there until you sat me down and pointed to the exact page. Um, so then I think the question for me became, okay, well, if Egypt is this motivating influence that you can trace definitely in English literature from the Renaissance to the present, why is it this space or this um, archive that people are drawn to so much? And then I think I started to explore those things myself. I mean, what would it mean to meditate with hieroglyphs? What would it mean to invoke these deities? I mean, I guess in the spirit of making shrines on the table. Oh, yeah. um, and I think eventually it got to a point where the academic work and the spiritual work really started to go in vastly different directions. And I think I had to ask myself a question, okay, well, which one do I want to explore? And I think I'm probably not as optimistic as others that the academy can ever be reformed to fully embody the um, explorations of, of these ideas about enlightenment, higher spirituality. Um, so I decided that I would leave the academy and move to Sedona, as most people, as most people do. Um, so I spent um, about two years in the desert um, diving deeply into these traditions and trying to understand um, what was their appeal. And again, how can I bring them into the 21st century in a new way? Um, particularly with African cosmologies, there is not a lot of work that really takes the intellectual complexity and power of them seriously. I mean, even in a space um, like this where there are conversations around near-death experiences, um, around contacts with non-human entities, I mean, we have African traditions that have spoken to these kinds of dynamics for thousands of years. I mean, literally, like the first literary texts of the human race, the Egyptian pyramid texts, are talking about life after death, are talking about becoming um, a star, mm -hmm. fall, um, flying out into the cosmic expanse, meeting different kinds of embodied deities or figures of all sorts. So what would it mean to actually take all of these rich resources that really encode some of the earliest and most powerful insights of the human species to apply to understanding some of these questions that we're interested in? Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me, it was wanting to maintain a certain kind of fidelity to the traditions themselves that actually drove me out of the academy and art became a haven or a safe space to actually not have those constrictors on, on my explorations of them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay, so to, to kind of draw a line between that and, and tarot, um, 
because that's what <laughs> one does naturally. Um, practice, right? So, so this makes me think of um, Greg, your project that you and David have worked on together, um, ufology and tarot. So well, yeah. I know you're going to share share with us, but I just wonder if you could set us up a little bit with like how why tarot, how this came about. Were you all practicing tarot or using the tarot kind of regularly and decided to kind of reimagine it or no one of us practices and uses the tarot and that's Susan Demeter and yeah. she is our consultant yeah so on that part of it that. uh I had training in the western western esoteric tradition in the 1990s I was in the builders of the aditum for a couple of years um, which is a break away from the golden dawn mm -hmm. as as many of these groups are Anyway, um, I learned tarot there. Um, I went up through like the first grade or whatever of the of the levels, and um, but then a few years ago, I was basically sitting in a cafe and I suddenly thought, I wonder what would happen if I would combine the archetypes of the tarot with the themes of ufology or UFOs, and what that might embody, um, because these archetypes are present in any field and you can find them. But I think they're particularly powerful uh, in the UFO field, at least they were for me. And I started this group a couple years later called the Right Brain Project, where we were trying to look at the UFO uh, enigma, problem, um, subject, from a humanities and artistic-based um, approach rather than a analytical data-based approach. Because, uh, my degree, the only degree I have is in art history, and I'm involved with artists, and so I thought, why don't we mine this side of it? Why don't we look at what the right brain does when people encounter um, a, uh, a, a, what we call the UFO or what we call the other or alien or whatever you want to call it? And um, uh, as soon as I mentioned this, the entire group acted like I had just plugged a, you know 120 volts into them. They was like, yeah, let's do that. Um, and Miguel Romero, the artist, had done a book cover for me, and he'd done a couple others. And he said he would do a sort of proof of concept. Yeah, I guess I'll show, show it. Us? Yeah. Um, and the first card I uh, thought of, and the first person I thought of as a magician was Jacques, and um, later presented this to him. And with some reluctance, he said, yeah, I think you should go ahead with it. So um, let me show this short little presentation. I got a, uh, we had a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, and we started on Halloween, strangely enough, and then it went, ran for a month, and at the end it was 204% uh, uh, funded, which totally stunned all of us. I did not know there would be such uh, uh, interest, but let me, let me show this so I don't have to take, that, take up too much time. Oh, yeah, thank you. Right. Okay, um, for the Kickstarter, I produced a little video. I wrote the script, and Susan, one of our contributors, um, did, the, did the narration. See if this works. We seem to look at the UFO as a thing to be examined, cataloged, and sent to a database. We hope to crack the enigma and solve a mystery that appears to have a singular and definitive answer. Based on the popular Rider Waite Smith deck, the UFOlogy Tarot presents the 22 major arcana figures as archetypes of historic UFO study. People like myself go on and on and on because we feel that it is that is the work that that has been given to us for for part of our life work. Thank you.
We're not here to prove that we're being visited by you know, aliens from this planet or that star. That may very well be true, but we have not done the basic work. I never believed in flying saucers, but I don't know. Why do mysteries? I guess I won't say anything to anybody about this. I wonder where it came from. Experience to go to some distant planet. Maybe this will prove the existence of God. I have recommended in my capacity as scientific consultant that competent scientists quietly study such cases when evidence from responsible people appears to warrant such study. There may be much of potential value to science in such events. They want each person to build their own relationship. They want this to be as diverse as possible. Hopefully the flow of information between us will improve. Look for the answers from within. The archetypes of ufology will help. Anyway, what, what uh, the idea behind this was that I thought that, um, and we all do think, all, all of us working on the project here, think that the only way people are going to be able to look at this subject and get anything out of it is to get some kind of personal connection with it. And one of the oldest ways, the oldest inter, uh, things you, you can use as an interactive media is the tarot. And it's a very powerful, it's very powerful imagery. And so we figured if we could combine this with some of the subjects and personalities uh, uh, involved in ufology and in the subject, that just looking at the cards would be a way to communicate all kinds of information through art, as we've been talking about a little bit here, that you cannot get from reading a book and just passively looking at words. Um, that part's good, that part's useful, and that part is, it, it should be um, utilized. But the, um, the important thing here, I think, is to, um, if you can find that personal connection, that uh, whatever uh, path you choose in going into this subject, or just about any subject, is, um, is going to be more personal to you. Just like watching a film and the filmmaker won't explain to you what the film is about, he or she doesn't want to explain it to you because that destroys the richness of the, um, of the message and the message that you might get out of it that the artist did not even intend but that works well for you. And you know, I had the support um, of, um, I forgot to mention I also Diana Pasolka who put me in touch with all, a lot of these people. And um, uh, Whitley actually picked the card that he wanted. <laughs> he said, I want to be the fool. And I said, we all said, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> and you can see he's, he's walking off a cliff, which is exactly what he did um, when he decided to uh, partake in the journey where he found out what his relationship to this phenomena is. Um, and uh, instead of the little dog, as they're in the rider weight, we have two cats. They're actually Whitley's cats that were in the cabin at the time. And they're, they're doing what cats do, saying, go ahead and walk off the cliff, we don't care. <laughs> uh, that, that is Jacques, of course, um, with uh, some of the symbols of things we associate with him. We, very small, and Miguel did this, which was really smart. Is a little, um, there's a little spider right there on the net. It's supposed to be the, uh, you know, it's a web, the web, because he was there at the beginning of DARPA. On the back of the spider, it actually says ARPA, but you can see it when you when we have a book. There's going to be a book with it. Can only go through these very quickly, so I don't take up everybody's time. Jenny Randalls, who's a UFO researcher from England, um, she coined a term called the odds factor. So we have her in, in, in a scenario of um, the Oz uh, theme. She's got ruby slippers on. 
Um, she's got, instead of the pillars, she has O and Z in tornadoes, uh, like tornadoes in the Wizard of Oz. And to honor her um, um, transgendered uh, status, we uh, Miguel actually put the rainbow in, which is also fits in real well with uh, Wizard of Oz. Jail and Hynek, we put the um, Socorro's um, object in his hand. And the Halley's Comet, which he was born in the year the comet came out, uh, first visit, well, visited, and then he passed away the next time it came around. There's so many other details, but I don't want to go through them. Um, Stanton Friedman, we have nuts and bolts next to him instead of uh, pillars because he's <laughs> basically the proponent of the nuts and bolts theory of UFOs. And, and uh, blacked out documents, which you can see in his hand there. Betty and Barney Hill, we've very early on, I think I even thought they should be the lovers um, with, the, with the, uh, the old man of the mountain in the background, the dog that was with them, Delzy. Uh, very, you can't see them, but he's got an NAACP um, uh, thing on his lapel because they were active as, uh, in civil rights. And Druffle, and she's um, strength, and she's closing the mouth of a lion who has the face of Phil Class. <laughs> because she was, it was basically her strength of, of will that uh, uh, made her a force in ufology, especially as a woman. John Keel holding a, a lamp with uh, seven rays coming out of it, um, or eight actually, because he thought of there was one more ray in the spectrum that uh, represented uh, where UFOs came through and went in, came out of and went to. Trojan horses back there. There was Silver Bridge and the Mothman's up here. Um, the devil was a very easy one, that's Phil Class. And instead of horns and wings, he's got a stealth fighter behind him with the wings and the, the horns very conveniently as the tail of the stealth fighter. And that's Carl Sagan and Errol, uh, Edward Condon. Carl Sagan has a joint in his mouth because he was a, he was a, <laughs> uh, he smoked marijuana most of his life and then he kind of admitted it later. Anyway, yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's just the project we're involved in. So I, I kind of noticed that we, we hear a lot of names, a lot of names of, of friends, you know, people who found each other through the years around the subject of, of the anomalous or the impossible. Um, and I wonder if we could talk about the power um, of finding your weirdos, you know, finding your network of mutants or your, your family of um, experiencers. Um, and Angelo, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about about that kind of in the mission of um, of the work that you do, the um, the sacred inclusion network, sort of this this idea there of of building family around weird, cool stuff. Yeah, um, I mean, when people when when the Pew people do um, studies of people's belief systems and how they um, characterize themselves, they find that. Um, there's been this trend, even though uh, the majority of people, in, at least in the United States and for that matter in Europe, I don't know about, let's just say the United States, um, can, they consider themselves, I'm a member of this, I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a Buddhist, I'm a Jain, not that many of those. But, but, but that group has been gradually declining, although they're still the majority. Um, the group that seems to be ascending um, it's like if you give them a demographic box and you ask them, what do you, where are you? They will cross out none. And interestingly enough, the majority of those people are not atheists or agnostics. Uh, they're people in this category called spiritual but not religious. And um, essentially, that's our tribe. And, and interestingly enough, um, that particular group, it, it's, it's essentially ascending among people, I think, that are under, under 30. So how do we find them? I don't know. They're all around. I don't know too many people that go to church. You know, I really do. I knew a few. I know a few, and even them, they're looking for something else. You know, so it just seems that a number of people are in this sort of community. So I wonder about in your own life, like how did you find people that you connected with on this level? I don't mean to go all woo woo on no, you, Cameron. No, go woo woo. That's um, what we're here for. You know, um, it's like this magnetic thing that goes on. You know, um, in my case. I was thinking about your question earlier um, as to, I forget what the question was, but I was thinking about it when you asked it. Um, Wasn't that good of a question? Yeah, you, you were, you were, you were talking about um, haunted houses and, and something like that. I don't have a haunted house thing, but I know that since I was young, 
I could always, I could always hear an inner, an inner sound. And it wasn't tinnitus, mm -hmm. right? And I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what that meant. I would go to this group and that group until I found someone that claimed that they had the keys to the so-called sound current. You know, so um, it's my experience that there's a there's sort of like a magnetic thing that goes on that the, the people that you know we were we were, t we were t I was talking about synchronicity, mm -hmm. and we we sat down for the first time us, and um, I imagine is anybody in this room ever heard of the person Mountie Sadhu? There's one person that has. This individual over here to my left, I was amazed. My jaw dropped. Talking about the tarot, uh, he wrote a book called The Tarot, which is very influential in my, my so-called intellectual development. Um, that's really not a, really about the tarot as much as it's, it's, it's sort of like a, it's, it's like a course in Western esoteric philosophy is what it is. So I guess the short answer is that this is a magnetic thing that happens. Just as when I met um, Dr. Rene Mollenkamp at this conference, who was a lapsed Jesuit priest, uh, people find each other. So the question for me is not necessarily looking around for them, but just sort of like opening up myself mm -hmm. so that people show up. And that's what happens. Jay, as the oh. experiencer group, <laughs> oh, geez. Has that sure. ha have you found that to happen like over the internet also? Or does the internet yeah, there, there's a recognize lot of, There's a energy? lot of resonance. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I mean, it's true. I mean, it's it was part of the impetus for the whole community and the inspiration there is that you know, when I was in my early to mid 20s, really trying to find answers um, at the time, uh, I would look at places like Above Top Secret or Project Avalon or all these kind of Bolton boards that had been around for a while that could roughly straddle these topics. But they always had, there's always a level of trolling, there was always a level of skepticism that, was, that would be in there and a lot of infighting. And, and of course, the UFO people didn't want to talk to the haunting people. The haunting people didn't want to talk to the UFO people. And so, you know, I couldn't find a relevant community uh, in person or online that could handle abduction experience in a really adult and respectful way. Years later, though, I realized my art studio and my undergraduate years was just two and a half blocks away from where Bud Hopkins lived. But <laughs> so, but anyway, um, I also couldn't find people that were respectfully and and thoughtfully dealing with those hauntings. So with our community, we have many hum hundreds of members, some of whom are here with us today, and we actively work to try to make room for experiencers of all modalities um, just for that reason. And there is an element of sympathetic resonance. You know, there's, there's the element of uh, we vet people as they come in the door um, just with three questions. Um, and for whatever reason, that seems to kind of do the trick these days. What are the three questions? The three questions are, um, they're pretty simple. One of them is, uh, tell us a little bit about you and your experiences, mm. uh, however briefly you'd like. And some people, it'll be, you know, <laughs> and they'll just cut and paste from some Word document they've been working on for years. And some people will have something really short and sweet. And, um, and also, how did you hear about us? And give us uh, a link or two to prove that you are who you say you are. Mm. And that could be social media, that could be a website, a LinkedIn, anything. And some people are creative and they don't have a Facebook profile, which I totally get. I don't have a Facebook profile anymore. And, um, and so some people are creative and say, oh, you're just gonna have to call me. I'm 78 years old and I don't do that. Or, you know what I mean? Or, or they'll give a recommendation. They'll say, oh, talk to this person who is already in the group or something like that. And oddly enough, through those three questions, like it's, it's been able to filter out quite a, quite a bit of, of the trolls and the, the people that you might find otherwise. And um, so we've been really lucky that way. And then once people are in, they either kind of are able to do uh, we try to keep a spirit of open-mindedness, and so we try to do, like Jeff was talking about earlier, not landing, you know, not landing on things. And I, um, and so some people can do really embrace that, and some people don't. We joke sometimes that some people walk in and they, they want to kind of, they they assume that we're all gonna have already gotten on board on the whole end of times prophecy or something <laughs> like that, and we sometimes joke that you know it's actually easier for people to think that the world's gonna end certainly 
than to keep all these options in play. You know, it's like more restful to think that the world's going to end. Mm. And so there's, there's resonance there too, where in terms of trying to keep an open mind. My first thought was which end of times prophecy would, would that be that, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, of the, that we all agree on? Point, right? yeah, yeah, I have absolutely. a question, Jay, just sure. to follow up on what you're saying. So you're saying experiencers of all modalities. Yes. So I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the broadness and the scope uh -huh. of what all modalities means for you. Sure. And, and also, how do you deal with the different metaphysical um, leanings that that might entail? I mean, because I can understand why someone who, let's say, can accept the UFO phenomena might have problems or have a difficulty accepting haunting. So how do you actually mediate the real differences in worldviews and perspectives that, that might come with this radical inclusion of all modalities? Yeah, it's an, that's a great question, and um, and as we've been doing this for just only 13 months now, though we had a kind of pri a private network before that, before the site really came on board, we're still e exploring the kind of boundaries and the contours of of what really does constitute anomalous experience, and we we found ourselves, you know, I've explored the what initially was the outside of my comfort zone, you know, initially. Um, we had some people that came in and were like, actually, you know, I'm a magician. And, and I, had, I had never really hung out with magicians before. And now, you know, I've, uh, after book clubs and, and many groups, you know, I've, I've, we've, I've got a whole shelf of magic tomes sitting there, you know. And it's, it comes down to, I think, um, when you talk about what's the breadth, you know, it's, it's, there are people, it, it often comes down to the ontological shock factor and the, the idea of, of, of kind of subtle sensing in a way. You know, for some people, it would just, it could be as simple as, as seeing a cryptid in the woods one day, right? And, and you know, that's, that would be an experiencer. And then other people um, are really deeply affected by not being able to turn off, like, a channeling voice, mm. Right. And it's it's it can be really difficult to to uh, to be frank to to explore all of that within kind of a one room schoolhouse, and so we try to do breakout groups as well. But um, because sometimes it can be challenging for somebody first walking in the door, they've just been experiencing stuff for four or five months. They have a lot of questions, and they're just going to kind of they just want to get it all out initially and. Sometimes it can be challenging to when they encounter somebody that's been that is wearing their experience or uh, like a comfy suit, and they've been they've been kind of been able to talk about it for thirty years or something like that. So, um, gosh, I don't know where I'm going, Marcus. But but um, what was the rest of your question there? No, you answered it. This okay. is about the scope and how you mediate between people with really radically, possibly radically different yeah. perspectives and metaphysical commitments. It's, um, there's, I mean, it really comes down to a super simple "don't be an asshole" kind of rule <laughs> when it really comes down to it, you know. And 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 amazingly, people tend to um, they respect the community enough that that we've had very few instances of that. And so, you know, in the last six months, maybe three or four people had to be kind of shown the door. But otherwise, people treat each other really well. I think it's just that people recognize that it was deeply in need, you know, that it just didn't really exist. And, and thankfully that, or it, not in this fashion anyway, with this kind of breadth. And yeah, I have a question for you. And I think this is one Cameron had on our list, um, which is about um, something that we're both passionate about, which is creating sure. community. Yes. And... Um, I, I think I'm, I frankly I, I suck at it, quite honestly. You know, I do I do my best. I'm better with like helping other people do it and actually sort of like creating this thing. So I'm just wondering what what the secrets are. What 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 are the challenges are? Um, what are the challenges for you? And um, you know, what are the successes in terms of creating community? I mean, it's one thing to have like a sort of a group of people that are presenters or experts and um, they want to share knowledge. Well, I guess that's a community. It's mm -hmm. another thing to have a real sort of networked. Um, mm -hmm. No one's really totally in charge. Maybe there's somebody that has to handle the administration. Sure. But but I'm just just curious. Just talk. You know, um, I think there are a couple key factors in terms of like the the secret sauce for for that. One would be that 
um, for our support sessions, um, letting everybody have a turn to speak on, and, uh, uninterrupted, as is the case for, for many kind of support, a typical support meeting structure. And just, just letting people be in a space of respect, of mutual respect, and being able to speak uninterrupted, and that people being able to sense, um, number two, the lack of stigma, or the lack of kind of, the, the, the stigma elephant is not in the room at least in a present way, and you know the furrowed brows or what have you. It's really, I mean, it comes down to just that, like feet, coming up with a normalized, mm -hmm. being able to normalize the conversation has been incredibly helpful, you know, for other experiencers um, to be able to kind of not have that charge. There's a lot of kind of unstated work that happens in the support rooms in terms of being able to being able to repeat the story enough times in different and new ways to new groups of people so that so that you can do it without your legs shaking or without, you know, whatever that happens to be, if that makes sense. And mainly through that, that's that's it, you know? And all people need all people want is to be heard, you know. I think that that's true um uh, across the board, you know. So, so I'm thinking of a particular sort of, I guess it's like a, I'll call it a technique that I use, especially when you get people together for the first time, or maybe when they, they don't know each other and maybe they have different points of views about things. Um, so in a process of dialogue, which I don't really need to discuss, it's basically a matter of, of setting ground rules that in our case we would use, speak from ex your experience as opposed to all these fancy books that you've read, yeah. and things of that nature. But, but setting a good sort of container mm -hmm. um, creates safety and it creates ability for people to learn and people to maybe to feel like they're part of something that is not going to hit them over the head with stigma and all that sort of thing. 100% agreed. Totally 100% agreed. So Thank you. I Thank think you. we want to move into questions from the audience. Yeah? Yeah? Feels good? Mm. Like that? Okay. Yeah, so let's, um, let's open this up and, and have a conversation. Who has a question or two? We're going to make some up if people don't <laughs> <laughs> All right. Can you raise your hand again? I think, it, yeah. You have to pass it down like Very like the, Phil Donahue. Yeah, like, like getting hot <laughs> dogs at the baseball. Date myself with that reference, but yeah. <laughs> uh, hello, and thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> See, I have a question about communicating mm -hmm. uh, impossible ideas. Mm -hmm. So I do a number of different things, but I do some writing, and I write on topics of meditation and spiritual philosophy. And I was very inspired by uh, an American philosopher named Richard Rorty, who toward the end of his life determined that fiction was a better way to communicate subtle ideas than more discursive forms of writing because it had more emotional content. Uh, so I, I've been trying to write, or I have been writing, I don't know how good it is, but I have been writing fiction. And I'm curious to hear from any of you, I mean, I know Cameron that you are uh, teaching memoir writing, I think you said, spiritual memoir. Creative nonfiction, yeah. Creative nonfiction, yeah. and, and, but I was curious what your thoughts are about the medium of words, mm -hmm. literature, for communicating ideas of the impossible. Obviously, Jeff Kripal writes a lot about that as well, but that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of the, the thought that's on my mind. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, and it's the kind of question that teachers of writing live for, so, so thank you for that. <laughs> um, I'm going to gently disagree with your, um, with your mentor and, and suggest that nonfiction is a fantastic vehicle for communicating the ineffable. I mean, the, the tools of fiction are the same tools that we use in creative nonfiction. And so creative nonfiction, we think of as an umbrella um, that encompasses memoir, personal essay, experimental essay. So, you know, essay that is not the sort of essay that we wrote in high school or even in, you know, freshman comp, but, you know, an essay as a um, from the French essay to attempt, right? So to go on a journey with a lively mind um, and follow uh, a narrator into a question. Um, and, and that question may never have uh, a satisfactory answer, but to 
um, paraphrase Anne Streber, better questions, um, less beliefs, better questions. So, um, so my biggest, um, kind of mantra that I harp on with my students in terms of how does one communicate the ineffable in language and words, um, it's really the same challenge, uh, of communicating anything that is non-corporeal, right? So we, we know love when we see it walk and talk and, and touch us, you know, we, we know it when it takes form, when it's a verb. And so similarly, one could say for spiritual phenomenon, we, must encase our spiritual, right? Sort of our, our, um, amorphous, um, in skin, um, and in, in form, um, and show, you know, just to go back to, uh, again, high school English, like show us what happened. Um, you know, and I was, I was thinking about the challenge of communicating, you know, the, uh, the change in temperature in a room when, something is present that we don't have a name for, right? And, and so what do we do? We go into our senses. Um, we go into what uh, Mar- Mary Carr, uh, the memoirist Mary Carr calls sacred carnality, right? So we, we drill down into our five senses and we tell you, this is what it tasted like. This is what it smelled like. This is what it feels like in my hand. Um, you know, sounds like, et cetera. And, and as long as we're continuing to go back into the body, Um, which I think is generally good advice in life, Um, you know, we can communicate that, which is ineffable. And of course, there are dimensions of it, which, which will always remain a mystery and up to interpretation. But but I I definitely, my vote for stick with nonfiction, we're we're here for you, we're here for your weird ideas. Um, um, Fiction is great, but but nonfiction is a really, a really exciting uh, genre of writing, I think as well. Great, Thank you. Yeah. I'd second that. There are many nonfiction writers that get me very emotionally involved in what they're doing, but it, it's you know it's the the craft of honing that mm-hmm. and and practicing it and having readers and have people react to it and tell you what you know maybe you should emphasize this or whatever. But yeah, um, and you said earlier about your friend's advice to you, which was about not boring the audience. Yeah, I, I have a friend <laughs> that passed away recently, Skylar um, Alfagrin, and she said uh, she was trying to teach me how to write. I asked her to read something. She said, I'm not going to be nice. And I said, I don't want you to be nice. I want you to be honest. And she read the first line and she said, why do I want to read the rest of this? <laughs> and I was kind of astonished. And she said, your job when you're writing, especially what she did, which was um, feature writing, is to convince the reader they have nothing better to do except to read what they're reading right now and not to go anywhere else. Yeah. They, nothing should be more interesting to them except what they're reading right now, and they have to think about that with every line. Yeah. So that, that was the best advice I ever got about writing, especially nonfiction writing. Well, any writing, I guess. I mean, one quick additional tip that I'll say here is to, to follow what Annie Dillard said, said, which is to put all of your death and destruction and... Um, tragedy and heartbreak in the very first sentence if you can or the first <laughs> sentences right uh-huh. so get it all in there um similarly yeah oh, people yeah. have a it's lot a big, of hey, potential distractions slap in the face yeah. like yeah. That's okay great. i better read this yeah. <laughs> anybody want to say anything else about that or questions yeah we got one do you want to wait for the mic or uh, sure. yeah just thought i'd see if any of you could speak to the um the impact that uh, media, cinema, Hollywood might have on society when it comes to portraying a lot of these different uh, types of phenomena in a fictional way and how that might change our outlook socially or increase awareness about certain subjects in a way that's not necessarily distorting our understanding of it scientifically. I mean, there's only so much we know, but it helps to provide some kind of framework for people who otherwise wouldn't know about it. Do you have any comments on how that's playing a role in our awareness? That's, that's open for any of the panelists. So just really quickly, as kind of like maybe a side point to that, I live in rural Georgia, and one of the things that I've been really surprised by is um, the integration of every subject that's on Ancient Aliens with folks that are good church-going 
Christians that would never consider themselves to be interested in the paranormal. <laughs> um, conversations at like gas stations, um, which have analog pumps, like it's not even a digital pump, and people will be talking about the Book of Enoch and, um, you know, discussing ancient aliens and, you know, the days of Noah and that kind of thing. And that tied into something that was mentioned earlier. Um, the, uh, I think, uh, Joe Laycock, you mentioned the, some of the ways that the charismatic spiritual warfare people draw in Valet and draw in Keel's work and draw in some of the discourse. Um, so it's been really interesting to see how, yeah, something like Ancient Aliens, which is a long running show, has reframed people's Christianity without necessarily giving them um, the sort of freedom that we're talking about here, you know? Um, but now they're, you know, they're thinking about the Book of Enoch and that. So it's really, you know, it's an interesting kind of thing to uh, to think about those kind of effects, which, you know, even though they're exposed to these ideas, they don't then necessarily go and grab a book on it. And if they do, they grab the book from the spiritual warfare genre, which is then going to reframe all this stuff in a very, you know, sort of Manichean, uh, good versus evil sort of way, you know. And I think that we can see it with the... Um, you know, with the UFO subject, um, so many of the recent documentaries, they've come out, but they still sort of return the same ground, you know, and it's not necessarily even the most interesting ground to be churning, um, you know. So yeah, I mean, what does that do to the, what does that do to the conversation in terms of closing it off or reframing it, you know? Um, you had brought up the Collins Elite idea, right, from Nick Redfern's stuff. Um, for me, I like to look at those kind of things as sort of like uh, frameworks. I mean, you can look at the Collins Elite idea, right? And no, at no point in Nick Redfern's stuff or in um, most of the conversations around the Collins Elite does anyone ever mention Jeff Charlotte's book, The Family, or even the Netflix series that went through the connections of power groups in Washington, the military, um, different kind of things, and then Christian right conservatism. So this Collins elite thing exists as sort of a social myth that sits on top of the reality of these power networks, which Jeff Charlotte's research has totally mapped out. Like, you can get the back of the book and look at all the names and everything. <laughs> Redford never goes into any of that because he's not writing to the reality. He's writing these sort of folklore of, of the reality, you know? And so what does that do to the conversation? because it's ineffective to say the Collins elite and to keep repeating that versus saying, you know, um, Billy Graham was in Nixon's office saying really horrible things, you know what I mean? And then <laughs> Billy Graham goes and he's doing demographic net, you know, network diagrams of the different places he goes for his revivals and that. So real world effects, real names, that kind of thing versus the Collins elite. And that ties into the spiritual warfare stuff where a lot of these people that are citing Valet or Kiel, um, you know, some of them are Pentagon advisors. So what does that mean, right? Like that they're writing like things about end times, you know, giant revivals and that kind of thing. And then they're going and advising the Pentagon on defense stuff, right? And so that's like the real world Collins elite sort of idea, but it's covered up by this term that's been popularized in the paranormal culture everybody talks about the Collins elite, nobody's talking about the actual networks of power, you know, and that sort of thing. So that's, yeah, I would say it's, it's something definitely to think about. And I know that, you know, Greg and I talk about this quite a bit, you know, um, just what does it mean to mediate these subjects and to, to put that out there? Because the other thing is that people don't talk about Jeff Charlotte's book because it's more detailed and maybe not as exciting as like the Collins elite, you know, like, and Redfern's, you know, that's his job is to make it exciting. To don't bore your reader, you know. So how do you do both? How do you give the truth and also not bore the reader, you know? Marcus, did you want to say something about Hollywood and cultural impressions of paranormal or anomalous phenomenon? I was just reading that you did. Your energy was telling me that you did want to say something. <laughs> but if you don't, <laughs> Well, okay I think too. for me, I guess... That was a great answer that David <laughs> gave, and it's hard to follow that. Um, but I think what I would say 
Um, what I'm still seeing in the specific space that I work in is a real demonization still of any kind of African spiritual tradition. Mm. Um, I mean, so I'm thinking most recently about American horror stories. I was just thinking that, yes. Yes, um, where specifically the coven yes. season where um, mm-hmm. Papa Legba, one of the most venerated figures of Vodun, is reduced to a cocaine sniffing, <laughs> baby killing, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, demonic <laughs> looking figure. I mean, and mm-hmm. that was the norm for the season. So it was just a very strange, um, super disrespectful, and um, mm-hmm. it's just a very bizarre kind of representation that really is in line with a whole host of those kinds of representations stretching back to. Um, even the graphic or the comic books in the 1940s and 50s that Yvonne Chiro talks about um, with this depiction of these cannibalistic Africans eating people and, and that sort of thing. So I would say it's still, um, I would say, a mode of social control when you can impact the subconscious of, mm-hmm. of a national and international community against whole traditions that might have certain kinds of keys to the exploration of consciousness in Mm -hmm. new ways. Um, If you can construct campaigns that basically cordon off whole swaths of of spiritual and religious material Mm -hmm. that might actually have some kind of beneficial impact on on a wider populace, that is a form of social engineering, that is a form of political manipulation, that's a form of impacting well it's actually a form of of witchcraft in and of itself because you're impacting the subconscious of a mass audience um through negative imaging and negative programming so i i will say i see that kind of work that hollywood does all the time which of course then goes into maintaining certain kinds of social hierarchies and the demonization of certain people and populations too Do we have time for one more question? Or no? Okay, I think we have one more question we can take. People are tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were going to ask everybody to go out and get coffee right before this. We got to go on right after lunch. <laughs> <laughs> that was a great segue into this book ending. Um, considering everything you've talked about, about subconscious programming and you know, re-engineering, I wonder what you are suggesting us to watch on the horizon. Up-and-comers, people that you stand behind in terms of their cultural projects, uh, the new uh, truth seekers, the truth tellers and their stories, um, exciting projects for the audience to be on the watch out for. That's a great question. Wish I had an answer for it. Well, I'm in one right now. Um, yeah. Jeff's, Jeff's project is, um, um, I mean, I think this is a great project, but... No, I was going to say Diana Pasalka has a book coming out. So yeah. Or Diana Walsh. And she's talking yeah. right after this. So I would definitely <laughs> be able to look out for that. And she will describe that, yeah. Um, yeah, I think, I think a lot of the best people are in this room, mm-hmm. actually. Which is, which also, is you, you, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that people don't realize have been around forever that are really good and that are really good to go back and look at. You know, any of Whitley's stuff, um, John Keel's stuff, um, uh, you know, even, you know, and then go listen to podcasts. And it's like uh, Steve Finley does great work around this if you want to look at um, how this impacts uh, different communities. Um, but yeah, it, it's all out there. And I think you just have to find it. That's what the Tarot Cards is about. Find out what interests you and then mine that because that will have much more impact on you. And, uh, you know, I get asked this question a lot. What should I read? What should I be looking at? It's like, you know what? You go find that thing. <laughs> You know, and it, it takes some work, but you got to do that work. If you truly are seeking this knowledge, you got to do the work yourself. And, um, you know, I'm sorry I don't have more uh, more suggestions about what to go look at. But, yeah, if it's, you know, spirituality, go look at that. If it's, you know, something related to the sciences, go look at that. Um, and it's very easy to find. Just type in these search terms and, bam, things will start coming up. And Diana calls this, what is it, book, um, the book journey or the book discovery? The book encounter. Book encounter, yeah. yeah. Um, people find these things. They'll have. They'll say, "What happened to me?" And then they'll go look that up, and suddenly they find this explanation. 
of, or at least something that helps them, gives them an in into whatever that meaning has, that, that experience or that search has for them. And there's probably a visionary in every circle. You yeah. Know? So, I mean, what are they reading? What, what, what's influencing them? Right, right. And they will lead you to other people. Yeah. They, they you know, that's, uh, you find one person, suddenly tributaries will come out and you'll find this entire, you know, David does this all the time. It's like, did you realize that some guy said that 50 years ago? I'm like, huh? What? And I'll go back and look and well, you know, I'll be damned. Yes. You know, so and so said this in 1948 or something like that. It's it's amazing what you can find. Um, I, I just I wanted to say that I think um, I think often of the of the term occult, right, and the sort of the the etymology of it and the history of it. Like some things are necessarily hidden, and not to be you know, uh, not to say that there aren't new voices com coming on the horizon because there are. Um, and I hope to be one of them. I'm working on a project about women and witchcraft right now, um, but. But sort of how I read liner notes when there were albums <laughs> and CDs back in the day to find out who my heroes were listening to. Similarly, I read th the thank yous in, in books that I love and sort of see who the people that I'm reading, who they're reading, et cetera, et cetera. So, Jay, did you want to say one more thing? Yeah, um, just since he, he wasn't able to make it and I was actually, I'm kind of subbing in for yeah, him on the panel, yeah, I, would, I would suggest Stuart Davis's wonderful Aliens and Artists podcast, which yes, is one of the best one. Uh, oral hi histories currently running of, for experiencers. He's, he's planning on capping it at about 100 episodes. He's, I think he's 88 in or something like that. And uh, Jeff's been on there and Leslie's been on there and many, many other people in this room have been on there. And, uh, Stewart also just had a film funded. Did he? Do you hear that? So he's making an independent film, actually, that was just funded um, in the last few days. So I think that's yeah, something I think to watch the, out for the, as well. Yes, yes. Yeah. There's there's going to be a lot on the horizon. Yeah. And there's so. Whitley's, is it called Another Country? Is that what it's called? His uh, Unknown, country. Unknown Country. Unknown Country. That's yes. an enormous source of um, interesting material. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all. Thank you.